Hello everyone and welcome to the second appointment of the Money Lab 8 streaming series hosted on the Axioma streaming channel on a weekly basis every Monday at 5 p.m. Central European time. If you missed the previous event with Brett Scott and Hert Loving entitled Critical Finance Strategies three months into the corona crisis, you can find its documentation in the Money Lab 8 website. The Money Lab 8 is part of the series of conferences, tactics and practice that Axioma organizes every spring at Kino Shishka in Ljubljana. This year's edition is realized in the framework of CONS platform for contemporary investigative art and in collaboration with the Institute of Network Cultures of the Amsterdam University of Applied Science. Today, we finally stream live. Therefore, we have implemented a new feature to our website a chat where you can post anything you want to share with us, ideas, suggestions, comments, links, and of course, questions you would like to ask. The idea is to give the moderator the possibility to collect some questions from the special guests who are present here with us today physically at Kino Shishka and combine them with those coming from the audience online. Today's talk entitled Beyond Solutionism in a Post-COVID-19 World will be given by Eugeny Morozov and moderated by Leonard Kucic. The current crisis with governments begging tech companies for help has highlighted the immense appeal of the ideology of technological solutionism. But what is its politics? And how does it relate to the other dominant ideology of the day, neoliberalism? This talk will explore the political effect of technological solutionism, survey its place in today's global capitalism, as well as suggest what a post-solutionist politics might look like. Eugeny Morozov is a writer on the social and political implications of information technology, and he is the author of The Net Delusion and To Save Everything, Click Here, both published by Penguin Books, respectively, in 2011 and 2013. His monthly column on technology and politics appears in several international newspapers and his writings have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Financial Times and other publications. He is the publisher of Syllabus, a weekly selection of new academic articles, essays, talks, podcasts and more. Lenar Kucic is a journalist and podcaster at Podcerto, a Slovenian independent investigative media outlet focusing on investigative reporting, data journalism, and in-depth stories. He follows the trends in telecommunication and information technologies and tracks the changes brought about by the convergence of the communication and media industries. He is the author and co-author of several books expert articles and studies on the topic of media ownership and new media. Dear Eugeni, dear Leonard, welcome. The virtual stage is yours. Hi. Thank you, Janis. <laughs> Hi. Uh, well, first, I'm really glad I can uh, welcome you all to this Money Lab 8 conversation and you, Evgeny. Uh, I think the last time we met was where at Macchiato in Perugia years ago. <laughs> when it was still live, I guess. Uh, it's a great time for, I mean, great time can be used a bit in ironic sense for such a conversation because um, when we were finishing our report on how algorithms and systems for automated decision making are used in the European Union, um, we found out that just after we were finishing our report that we already had to have um, an editorial meeting because the COVID crisis started and we said, well, now we should really, really, really uh, watch carefully what our governments are doing because it's very likely that they will use the pandemic to introduce and to legalize all technological gadgets, you know, for data analysis and everything. And uh, unfortunately, we were right. Uh, we see that all of a sudden, um, some more authoritarian Asian states were set as an example, you know, how to fight such a pandemic, uh, even despite the fact that they are not really compatible with European ideals. And the government started uh, testing the idea that we should use our mobile phones as tracking devices to keep people under control uh, when they are 
locked in quarantines or that we should use some special applications for content, I mean, for, for tracking uh, our social contacts. And even Apple and Google are also considering that they should make this feature as a part of their operating system, which would, of course, you would just you know, turn up your phone and set the update and it will be done. And um, you're, I think, in this strange kind of times, uh, you, you seem to be um, the right person to talk to because uh, you were trying to articulate uh, this sort of ideas and thinking for quite a while. And uh, maybe we should start with uh, a list, uh, a very particular kind of list, uh, which you edit and curate at the syllabus. I think that the collection of essays, studies, podcast videos, and other on COVID-19 already exceeds 1,000 items. And uh, can you say, are there any, let's say, common narratives? 10, actually, at this point. <laughs> already, only for yeah. COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Are there any, let's say, narratives that can be extracted from all this body of work? How do we comprehend, think, or consider the COVID-19? Sure. Well, I think it might be useful just to say a couple of words about uh, why I decided to spend any time uh, doing, you know, curation, essentially. You know, I spent years at this point, probably a decade, uh, being quite a happy intellectual, working in archives and writing and studying languages and you not know, bothering with uh, a lot of applied work. But eventually, last year, it became obvious to me that um, first of all, my own needs as an intellectual were not really being satisfied by the market, uh, quote unquote. But it also became obvious to me that it would be possible uh, using a real case study and a real example to show that the rhetoric of us living in the most innovation friendly times ever because mm -hmm. this big technology companies run the show, that that rhetoric is false. That essentially uh, many of the solutions uh, that we accepted from them for organizing the information or creating it or you know, discovering information, uh, discovering what matters and what counts and what doesn't, that a lot of them are actually quite inferior to what even today's state of technologies allows us. Right? And the reason why they're inferior is because they either some kind of an afterthought uh, of very different business models. So, you know, in the case of Google Scholar, for example, if you look at Google, it's obvious that it's not a product with which they make any money, and yet it's a product that virtually all academics use to do scholarly research, right? But it's designed extremely badly, and it offers you a very bad experience. But um, and then beyond that, if you look at the more commercial uh, side of the story with Twitter and Facebook, which do channel and direct our attention and kind of, you know, command the attention economy, if you will, their services, because they're driven by advertising, they also suck, if you will, at uncovering uh, things which are really important, which deserve to be read and studied. And it's that they uncover things as which they can make more cash, right? So... Uh, putting those two motivations together, I started this project called the syllabus, whose goal is to essentially show that a very different logic of content discovery uh, and kind of channeling information and attention is possible. And that uh, it is hopefully possible to convince people that we are actually under innovating rather than over innovating, hmm. right? And that essentially these companies have now become barriers to us uh, making full advantage of information technology. So of course, for me, it's quite a radical change in orientation and rhetoric because it's uh, it's it's much more of the kind of techno-utopian project, even though of the applied variety that I have spent so much time criticizing. But on the other hand, it's also a way to show that, um, you know, there are deeply political decisions behind virtually all the digital infrastructures that we use. And once you tweak them somewhat differently, a very different technological universe will emerge, which will get us to solutionism. And I will answer a question about the narratives that emerge. But I think it's very important to understand that for me, the underlying narrative is that even something as important as information discovery about the pandemic 
can be done much better if only we decouple it from the kind of commercial immediate incentives of the companies that run our digital infrastructure. So you know, in the case of the syllabus right now, we don't charge anything. And you know, if you ever want to start charging for the subscription fee and nothing related to advertising or user observation or surveys whatsoever, but the underlying message for me is that you know, our hands are tied because our imaginations are tied, right? And in that sense, uh, solutionism uh, as an ideology is uh, what ties both. You know, we don't have alternative infrastructures. And since we don't have alternative infrastructures, we cannot imagine what else can we do with them. Right. And uh, we have accepted this idea that uh, the tech industry are the good guys and that uh, if something better could have been invented, it would have already been invented by them. It's kind of the tech equivalent of the efficient market hypothesis, you know, in, in, in mm-hmm. economics, which was the previous financial crisis where the idea was that, you know, the, the markets uh, are always good at pricing uh, everything. So if uh, there was ever a possibility that something was mispriced, some clever entrepreneur would have taken advantage of it already. And I think we have this attitude towards tech to some extent. And uh, this, is why I, this is why I think um, so little radical innovation uh, at the margins, if you will, is happening. But in terms of broader themes, I mean, we as a publishing outlet, we have chosen a very deliberate focus. So, you know, we cannot really speak to the science behind COVID. So that's why we call it the politics of COVID. And we look specifically at various aspects that are of interest to us and, you know, my editorial team. So it has to do with class, has to do with labor, has to do with kind of social toll that uh, the, the pandemic and the way in which we deal with it exerts on vulnerable populations, minorities, um, and so forth. There are, of course, a lot of discussions that we track and index in uh, more than six languages uh, related to the future of capitalism, how it relates to any alternative modes and models of economic and political organization. So, uh, you know, the narratives that emerge, uh, uh, I think they are not, how should I put it? I mean, it would be naive to expect uh, a template or a blueprint of some kind of how we should remake the world in the aftermath. It's just too early. And, you know, I, for the past two months, I've been resisting the invitations and the temptations uh, from the media to make any predictions about this crisis, because ultimately I think uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the prerogative of fools to be making predictions so early uh, into the game. But uh, the narratives that I think uh, are missing from the mainstream and, you know, that's why we don't spend much time tracking what the New York Times says or what the Wall Street Journal says, you know, because those perspectives already covered quite well are, you know, the voices of people who are directly affected by it and who are not members, you know, of the upper ruling classes. So I don't really care what the perspective of some trader in Wall Street is on this or what the perspective of the New York Times editorial board on this is, right? So we deliberately go out of our way to find perspectives that are less anglo-centric uh, but that are also a little bit beyond just the perspectives of intellectual and financial elites so in a way you are acting as a corrective because uh, if we just follow as you say the mainstream press or the tech press all we hear more or less is uh, about mm-hmm. new application for for contact tracing and then of course the usual privacy issues whether it's compatible with gdpr and stuff like that but you don't really read very many let's say techno and social essays on this uh, well we have some of that related to tech but again for us uh, you know this is not just some kind of a tech event right it's 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 a kind of mm-hmm. a, 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 a very big social, political, economic, historical event. And uh, I think that the perspectives on it that come from the mainstream media are to some extent somewhat shallow and repetitive. You know, it might seem interesting to be reading a comparison between the Spanish flu and uh, COVID-19. But mm-hmm. once you've seen 200 of those pieces in six languages, you understand that they kind of fit into some kind of a pattern. And then you can easily identify them and you can predict what the next article about this kind of historical comparison to Colorado to uh, the uh, Spanish flu would be. So in that sense, we try to find things that are original, but also try to find things that are not exactly, uh, that have a shelf life longer than, you know, months or two months that you would still read and 
you know, three months from now, you would think it's a fantastic perspective, which immediately removes most of the traditional news items, which uh, just report about, you know, this government decided this, this uh, European Commission official said that, and that's just of no interest to us for this particular project. But, you know, despite what you said about resisting the temptation, you did publish uh, a piece uh, in The Guardian a month ago. And there, mm -hmm. well, there is a sort of a prediction on where uh, should we or where could we be moving um, in the following mm -hmm. years. So if you can maybe summarize this article for our listeners, because probably not everybody had read it. Sure. Well, uh, you know, my attempt in that Guardian piece was to actually apply a broader intellectual and political paradigm of solutionism, which mm -hmm. I've been working with uh, for almost a decade now. I've introduced it first in my 2013 book, but it's been kind of on my table probably since 2012 or so. And uh, the way I deal with solutionism and the way in which I use it to explain, you know, social reality, it has changed and evolved since then. So, you know, the solutionism as I see it of 2020, uh, at least as I use that term, is not the same term that I used in 2012 or 2013. Uh, you know, um, back then, when I first introduced that term, and I did actually got quite wide coverage afterwards you know for me probably the sign of uh, success or achievement was to see uh, that term used in the silicon valley series right which kind of became this uh cultural reference uh, for for quite a lot of gigs uh, so uh, that term has kind of acquired some cultural currency and the way in which i introduced it originally was um, I would say almost apolitical. So there was not a great political dimension in it. It was kind of a humanistic critique of this geek, uh, nerdy mindset of people in Silicon Valley, which kind of quantifies problems that are much more unruly and ambiguous, right? So much of my initial critique of solutionism was that it's a way to pigeonhole complex social reality into this epified form where essentially easy solutions are available at the click of a button, but in reality, there are always hidden costs entailed by any such solutions, right? But the kind of emphasis um, that, I, uh, that I put into that term at the very beginning, it problematized this uh, kind of blind spot in the mindset of uh, people in Silicon Valley, right? So a lot of it was almost like ideology critique. There was kind of no connection to any kind of broader analysis of capitalism or neoliberalism it was almost a standalone term um, which was fine in an essay but it was a bit hard to fit it into a theory and so i would argue that back in 2013 when i finished to save everything quick here i did not offer any theory of solutionism i offered kind of a descriptive label um, and since then, I spent a lot of time, and that's why I didn't publish much, uh, at least not books uh, in, in that period, kind of trying to cook a theory out of it. And I think that by 2020, I have sort of succeeded where there is a much more explicit and well-defined connection to neoliberalism and capitalism, where there are political stakes outlined much better, where, you know, solutionism turns uh, from being this kind of relatively uh, quirky and exotic concept into, I think, a more robust kind of theory where I can kind of show the political effects of it, so how it inhibits our ability to use technology, for example, in an alternative manner, how it relates to neoliberalism, and, you know, in the essay I wrote for The Guardian, even though it was very short, uh, you know, I still position it that way. So I, for example, you know, just to give you maybe some historical context, for me, solutionism is the product of a certain uh, feeling that ruled uh, the elites, if you will, of this, of this planet in 1990s and 2000s, right? So emerging from the Cold War and the victory in the Cold War, uh, it became obvious on the one hand that uh, the job of spreading neoliberal ideology, which was fundamental in destroying uh, the capitalist system, the communist system, 
uh, that that job would become much easier because the main ideological enemy, which is the Soviet Union, uh, was no longer part of the picture. Right. So on the one hand, it became much easier to spread the gospel of free markets uh, and to basically because there was no uh, opponent to it. But at the same time, um, as it became easier to spread this gospel of free markets, free markets themselves became increasingly digitized. So information technology became widely available and widely ubiquitous, and it became possible for some at least to grasp uh, an alternative organization of production, but also social life that would be heavily mediated by digital technologies, but would not necessarily default to capitalism. Right? And I would argue that uh, this early kind of projects so of free software and eventually Wikipedia, even though they lend themselves to alternative readings and interpretations, they, at the back of our minds, kind of, it, 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 they projected this idea that you know, society can be organized on principles other than the price system and other than competition and still not default to central planning. Right, because this dichotomy that you can only choose between free markets and central planning was the central mechanism through which uh, this ideological battle of the Cold War was won, and the possibility of information technology opening up a new ways of coordinating social activity that did not default to either of those two poles, it in some way presented a big problem for neoliberalism, but also for, you know, the kind of capitalist class as such, because it became obvious that uh, left unattended, all these tools uh, might be grabbed by social forces who are not particularly big fans of capitalism to begin with. So solutionism uh, emerges uh, as a way to basically prevent alternative deployments of these digital technologies. So as neoliberals go about preaching free markets and privatization and marketization of everything, right? Uh, there needs to be some kind of a counterforce that would be able to ensure that the digital technologies that come together with markets and privatization are not used to subvert the original neoliberal logic of the system. And solutionism as a kind of uh, discourse and as an ideology, it emerges in those conditions and its main kind of uh, ideological talking point is that uh, you know the technology companies uh, are the most adequate and best providers of digital technology we should stick with them and they should be the ones setting the terms of access and of ownership for all the digital infrastructures that we have and it's based on their hegemony and their dominance that the rest of society should kind of uh, adapt itself, right? And this is where we enter this discourse of, this, of disruption and everybody has to adapt and you either disrupt or die, you know, and I can go on and on and on, but the uh, kind of, and it was just an illustration, right? So this you know, relation to neoliberalism is just one of the many facets uh, of solutionism as, as, as an ideology, but to bring it closer to the current, moment with, with COVID, I essentially think I did uh, what most intellectuals did in this uh, time, and you know, I'm quite cynical about it. I reached for the concept that made most sense to me to describe you know, the past 15 years, and I tried to apply it to understand what a post-COVID-19 world would look like. Right? And it seemed obvious to me that of all the many concepts available, solutionism was not the worst one to apply in part because it already problematized this relationship of the public on the tax sector as its savior, but also as its key kind of intermediary, which uh, controls and shapes its most important infrastructures and which in one way or another becomes the new unaccountable political class. Uh, and in that sense, I think solutionism as a concept did a pretty good job. And uh, part of my intervention with the Guardian article, which we can discuss uh, as, as much as you wish uh, later on, was to show that the traditional set of concerns that were being raised at the time with regards to big tech and the kind of the technology sector, and this are the traditional concerns related to privacy and surveillance, that they do not entirely capture the whole set of political effects 
uh, of uh, and consequences of this transition to a completely solutionist paradigm. That you know the consequences of our reliance on the tech companies are much deeper and greater and more diverse, and though by and large negative, but they cannot be pigeonholed just into these baskets of privacy and uh, surveillance, which is kind of typical liberal way to discuss these issues. And so solutionism yeah, probably... was one way was one way to uncover these extra dimensions and somehow connect it, and I can tell you how it's connected in the, in the, in the follow-up, to connect it to the possibility of deploying these digital technologies for an alternative project, right? And that, to me, became extremely important in the last, you know, five, six years. It's thinking about how an alternative political universe can emerge if our technological universe looks very similar to what we have now, but still quite different in terms of ownership structures and whatnot. And I just felt that the traditional discourses of privacy and surveillance, which probably account for 90% of all of our debates about technology, they just do not very well capture this possibility of an alternative future because they just focus on protecting rights of individuals like most liberal tools and devices, but they have nothing to say about how the future world should look like. Uh, here, I just want to invite also our listeners to also contribute questions uh, that will be uh, asked a bit later uh, to use the chat box, which is uh, a side of conversation. And uh, yeah, we can also continue this um, thought because uh, now um, I was also thinking of a very old essay. I think it was published in 1995, the famous Californian ideology, um, where was one of the first, let's say, for those times, viral and highly criticized um, attempt to show why uh, technology and neoliberalism are so compatible. Uh, at those times, it was seen as too pessimistic, as like, you can trust us, we we'll, won't abuse the power we have. Uh, we are still, you know, uh, tech people, geeks and techno hippies and all, you know, the positive progressive bunch. But now, like decades later, we see it's just not the case. And why is it still so hard to break this uh, connection between tech and neoliberalism? Um, well, it's, it's a good question. But I think m m m much depends on how we understand tech and yeah, liberalism to some extent. You know, for me, sure. uh, the, the Californian part of the story uh, does not make much of a difference anymore. In that, you know, of course, you can go and do a very thorough anthropological, cultural, and historical study of how people who go to Burning Man have come to believe what they believe about, you know, uh, how they relate to each other when they smoke pot or whatever. Right? So all of this are important questions which a lot of academics do. What's not clear to me is whether this fine-grained cultural, historical, anthropological study has much to do uh, with understanding what Facebook or Google or Amazon do as a company. And this is where, you know, I think that the pressure of capitalist competition and the need to stay ahead of the Chinese competitors, so they need to be accountable to the pressures coming from institutional investors it explains much more about what they do than the cultural study of their ideological beliefs of their founders. And part of what I'm saying is that I actually think that what Google, Facebook, and Amazon and Microsoft do, it's kind of completely rational. In that if you try to understand them as capitalist firms doing what it is that they need to be doing, they follow a pretty door logic. So the cultural component of this makes very little sense, makes very little difference except for the activity of legitimizing of what they do, right? So it's at the level of legitimacy uh, rather than at understanding their social behavior, or economic behavior, that we need to be applying this kind of soft cultural historical lens. And uh, it's true that essentially the reason why the activities look so legitimate partly have to do with the fact that neoliberalism as an ideology itself still enjoys quite a bit of um, resilience 
people use their own vocabulary, right? And then it enjoys quite a bit of um, legitimacy itself. So, uh, but this is a much more difficult study that we need to do because, you know, implicit, I think, in your question is the assumption that somehow we know that neoliberalism is bad and we think that technology is good and we don't see the connection between the badness of neoliberalism and the goodness of technology. But I think the real question we should be asking is whether we actually are also convinced that neoliberalism is bad. Right? And this is mm -hmm. where the, the question about the legitimacy of neoliberalism as a kind of system of organizing society and economy comes into the picture. And I think that despite the financial crisis, despite COVID, and despite uh, you know, many other shocks uh, of the past you know, 20, 25 years, despite climate change, neoliberalism as an ideology, if by that ideology you mean that uh, competition uh, is the right way to organize society, and certainly the right way to organize economic activity, and that if you don't do competition, then you are on the road to serve them, you know, to quote Hayek, that ideology is still very much with us. You know, I don't subscribe to it, and I think it's bonkers, but for quite a lot of people, that's still so. But it's still so in part because we're still prisoners of the same mental framework, and the certainly people on the left, that we have inherited from the Cold War era, where the only distinction to be drawn was between central planned economy and um, markets, right? And I just think that it's just a false the lab does not gain anything by continuing to play that game, right? And this is why I think there is a very big political debate to be had, including now in the post-COVID world, about what is it that the lab should be doing with big data, for example, right? Because one option is to basically say we need to use it for planning and we need to make sure that the planning that we used to do with very primitive, simple mechanisms in the Soviet Union, that they become much more dynamic and that they become powered by many more sensors and they essentially reinvent planning, but powered by big data. And this is one path, which I think occupies 90% of bandwidth of the few people who think about it on the left. Or there is an alternative path where we think about how we can use big data, sensors, AI, and all sorts of other modes of coordinating social activity and observing it and kind of doing some basic modeling around it. How can we use it for alternative forms of social coordination and social production, which would not default to competition, but they would not default to central planning either, right? And that, I would argue, occupies maybe the bandwidth of 10% of people on the left who think about big data in the kind of sort of this political lens. So um, I think unless we manage to articulate what's on the other end of neoliberalism, right? And I think that that could only be done by somehow articulating some kind of a high-tech project. Uh, these questions that you would like us to be asking, they would not be asked because people just do not see what's on the other side, right? And of course, people in kind of our smaller leftist communities, they are religiously committed to it, so they don't even need to be asking these questions. But the reason why neoliberalism is so resilient and legitimate in the kind of within the general public, I think, has to do with the lack of robust alternatives presented by the left. Yeah, because uh, one of the uh, things that I just thought now you were, when you were mentioning big data and central planning what brings to mind the idea of cybernetics because uh, that was the uh, idea like presented by norbert wiener and some other thinkers and tried and tested in chile under allende and in some places in the former soviet union and that was the idea you know, how to use technology in order to improve central planning and as you said, we still don't seem to be very far from this idea, you know, like how but again, you... it's, it, it depends on how sort of what cybernetic texts and in what context you read. So even exactly. if you read people who did work as I end this, even if you did Stafford Beer, whom I have studied, you know, extensively, there mm -hmm. you get um, uh, alternative conceptions, let's say, of uh, the competing conceptions, I would even say of what cybernetics can do for a non-capitalist project. So on the one hand, you can, of course, because you know, Stafford Beer, for example, you know, this famous cybernetician in Britain who now is being rediscovered because everybody is fascinated with Project CyberSea and this project in Chile. So Stafford Beer, in his 
previous life was a management consultant, right? So he uh, also was a business executive. So he uh, would, of course, be parachuted into a business environment or in a socialist environment, it doesn't really matter. And within the constraints that they have, he would tell you how you can deploy cybernetics in order to have a more efficient organization of production, right? Or a more efficient organization of organization, which is one way in which you define cybernetics. It's the study of organization, essentially, and not the study of feedback loops. Um, and clearly, he was parachuted in Chile, which had a couple of very important industries like Coker, for example, and uh, they had to run them in a very top-down fashion. And in that top-down fashion, uh, cybernetics could have been used in one way. But if you read his work, uh, abstracting from the specific tasks and projects that he was working on, whether it's in the corporate sector or in Chile, you can also see that inside uh, those theories, there is this idea that you know you can essentially delegate power to lower levels of social structures, and these communities can be self-organizing and self-sufficient in some sense or another, and they can be used they can use technology to boost their autonomy and independence, right? which also pushes against the idea of central planning, because if you can have kind of mutually autonomous, sufficient communities that uh, can be self-sufficient in one way or another, then the role of the state would be very different. It would be to make sure that they have the infrastructure and the, uh, I don't know, the supplies that they need in order to carry on with the autonomous activity, but it would not be the task of planning in very minor details every single uh, social activity that they do. That's what I'm saying is that even within cybernetic texts, you can find quite a lot of uh, positions and statements that will be supportive of the deployment of cybernetics for a non-capitalist project that does not default to central planning. Right? And I think we just have this very one-sided reading of it because we are tied by our historical examples. And it's true that you know the only places where non-capitalist projects were tried were central governments informed a very particular reading of you know marxism and leninism and uh, in that context uh, we did not really take full advantage of the opportunities that even cybernetics offered mm, true because when i finally read uh, cybernetics because it's one of you know those books that you that everybody seems to be uh, or quoting or whatever but a uh, few people actually read it and uh, when i finished the book, uh, especially the last two chapters, they are full of warnings now how, how dangerous it would be to use um, intelligent learning machines uh, to actually um, in the capitalist system. What would that mean? You know, how people would have to run against the machines, that there would be like a competition among slaves. And but those warnings usually don't get published or quoted in most of the, you know, te text technology texts they somehow get lost mm -hmm. yes but let me just can i just make an addendum to what we were discussing before this sort of because california ideology in the rotation i think you know when it was published it was clearly a very influential uh, and interesting text but i think and you know and it's definitely true about the relationships uh, going back to counterculture and to the cold war context I and mean, all of that is, is definitely correct but I think now, if we really want to understand um, Silicon Valley, even through the cultural lens or anthropological lens, we need to do a much better job looking at kind of global money, looking at um, philanthropic capitalism, if you will, looking at the ways in which all these big tech institutions are integrated with the states, with the State Department, USA, you know, all of the various U.S. agencies, U.S. government agencies, looking at ways in which it intersects with financial world, you know, because there is a revolving door now between Wall Street and Silicon Valley. And it's a much more sophisticated um, power structure and much better integrated into existing power structures of global capitalism than the Silicon Valley of uh, late 1980s and mid 1990s, where you had, you know, the hippies and you had, and you know, of course there are still hippies and of course there are still people going to Burning Man, but uh, I don't think that they're in the center of the story, right? And of course right now, 
Elon Musk probably sucks out like 90% of all attention paid on Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. right? But the real people that uh, are making deals are those that sit on various boards set up by Pentagon and who, you know, are integrated into various elite networks and those who, uh, you know, together with Bill Gates now are figuring out what the vaccine would look like, right? And it's them whom we need to understand much better. And this is where... You can only do that by starting elite networks, right? It's not just a matter of doing some kind of a cultural archaeology of where the beliefs of this particular set of people in Palo Alto come from. When we hear one of those very exposed guys, you know, tax executive talk about, let's say, um, the idea of uh, universal basic income, and the idea that the uh, incredible productivities of the machines should be used in a way um, to support us, like people who are not working. Uh, I think that once you said that whenever Silicon Valley starts using such terms as universal basic income, be very, very, very careful to understand what they are talking about. So mm -hmm. what do you think they are talking about when they are suggesting the idea of UTD? Well, in their case, I think uh, there are several reasons why they would be receptive to such ideas. Right? First, it's that for many of them, especially those that do not depend on advertising uh, heavy uh, business models and that instead uh, look for kind of monthly charges or subscriptions, for them, you do need to have... Uh, customers who are able to pay and who are able to pay their monthly fee for using whatever smart device that they're selling. So in that sense, having somebody take care of uh, giving cash to this uh, customers would be a good idea because then essentially that cash will find its way back to these companies. Right? So this is one reason. And the second reason I think is also now well understood. It's that for many of them, especially those that are involved with artificial intelligence automation, the uh, fear is that uh, there will essentially be a backlash of people concerned with the ways in which well, concerned with the political economy of automation, if you will, and the fact that the spoils and the profits of automation accrue to a very particular set of people, and those people do not happen to involve most of the workers whose jobs are being automated. So in that sense, uh, creating a way to at least uh, legitimate uh, what's going on through UBI uh, without rocking the boat and without redistributing ownership it's not the worst possible scenario. And especially in a time like now where the employment rates are skyrocketing because of COVID. Uh, but I haven't seen much movement on, on this topic since I think I published that article maybe three or four years ago. So, uh, and by now I think it has become even more uh, prevalent this attitude that UBI is somehow uh, something as Silicon Valley stands for. And it's very hard for me to imagine um, uh, an opposition to UBI from Silicon Valley. Right? So it's very hard to imagine why would they oppose it because uh, it's, it's an idea that uh, defined uh, along the lines of you know, Milton Friedman, for example, it makes uh, total sense to libertarians uh, and to neoliberals also. So in as much as it allows you to get rid of the welfare state and replace it with some kind of Palantir run digital services, it would also be a great welcome to many in this industry. So it's a kind of a perfect, it's a perfect setup. And that's why I think so many people in the tech industry love basic income, which does not mean that uh, it's a bad idea that I'm opposed to it, right? Uh, done right, and done was an ambitious structural transformation of you know who owns and controls what in our economy including at the level of infrastructure, universal basic income is completely, uh, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, but without this more ambitious radical transformation of ownership and a distribution of ownership, that's just a way to essentially uh, legitimate uh, this current transformation of the system where there is less and less welfare and more and more kind of privately run uh, state services. Yeah, and less jobs, because Mr. Henry Ford, back in the days, would increase wages. 
in order to you know his workers that they could afford the goods they were creating now any kind of increasing yeah. wages in tech sector is well no mm-hmm. nobody would agree to that uh, sure do you think that we can really think about like pre-covid and post-covid society in in those subjects that we are now discussing why do we feel that this could be a kind of a breaking point or is it more of a i well, don't know poetic metaphor to be honest why now? i'm quite well look uh, people with a political agenda whether they're on the left or right uh, they will jump at any opportunity to define post something because that post something will be uh, explained in terms that they themselves embrace, right? So uh, looking at it from the very kind of abstracted sociology of intellectual life, it's obvious why there is so much discussion about post-COVID-19 world. It's simply because that allows you to skip a lot of arguments uh, that you would normally use to tell us how you're going to get the way we need to get and then just say, okay, so in the post-COVID world, everybody will have universal basic income, (laughs) right? So it's kind of substituting this crisis for real intellectual work and political work, right? Because you can assume that that will happen because the crisis is so bad that some, you know, external factor will come in and take care of actually implementing all these paradigms. We, I tend to take a very restrained, uh, even somewhat, uh, I don't know, uh, even how to define it. I, I, I don't think that unemployment maybe and economic hardship aside that we are going to experience and find ourselves in a radically different world from the one in which we have lived for the last two decades. I don't think that uh, a crisis that disproportionately hits the weakest members of society, including you know, workers, women, minorities, and so forth, I don't think that a crisis like this creates a revolutionary situation where they would take power and somehow overthrow the ruling elites. I just don't see how that would happen. And in fact, they're at a disadvantage now. So in that sense, I think that the post-COVID world might look even nastier and uglier from the one in which we've been living. And in that sense, I don't have uh, a lot of hope. But uh, that said, um, I think it also crystallizes certain problems. And, you know, so this discussion we've been having about tech solutionism, to me, for example, the crisis does crystallize the immense power of technology firms, not just to control our movements, which I think is an important but somewhat trivial concern, but to control our imagination, because it's the likes of Google and Apple at this point, and Amazon, maybe and Microsoft, that define how we think about how technology can truly affect social and political organizations. Right? And then uh, that's why we cannot uh, go very much beyond thinking that, well, all that we can do with cloud computing is to offer it as a service. Uh, or what we can use artificial intelligence is to have uh, Google run it and then send you the bill uh, you know, for running whatever services you'd like to run on top of it. That's pretty much where our imagination ends. And the upside if one can use that word, the current crisis is that at least it will crystallize some of these problems and dependencies. Now, I I cannot assure you that there will be a political agency to act upon these revelations. I hope that there is one, uh, and who knows, there might be one. But my fear is that uh, technology, which is a field that I know best, still remains this orphan issue in that sense, that there is no constituency uh, that would really like to take it on as the core issue, uh, certainly not among political parties. And, you know, we've, we've been having this debate probably for decades as to whether we can ever expect a political movement like the Greens to emerge around technology, right? And at some point, there have been signs that maybe the pirate parties would do that, but uh, they did not do mm. it, at least not as we were hoping, despite some exceptions, like, you know, the, the guy who's now the mayor of Prague and, and whatnot. But 
that aside, um, as long as technology remains an orphan issue and it is not uh, bread and butter of trade unions, it's not bread and butter of political parties, um, I don't think that these revelations and these crystallizations that this crisis has enabled would get us very far. Right? And that's the sad part. And this is where, you know, even intellectuals like myself, we are kind of despair because it's not as if we haven't tried to put it at the center of agendas of political parties or their foundations or the think tanks or the trade unions. But it's just that it's because of various other commitments, including commitments probably to parts of neoliberal dogma, which they have accepted and digested, but they cannot now renounce. Uh, the sectors just don't act on... Um, they just don't act upon their insights, right? So technology remains as if it was just this autonomous force with its logic, and they continue thinking of it as just applied science of some kind, where you know things get invented and then they become universally known, and then who are we to believe that somebody can invent things better than Google or Apple, right? And um, and it's this kind of discourse that I think we need to destroy, but there are still a lot of unknown unknowns for me as to who will drive this political transformation. Yeah, it's almost like a theological debate sometimes. Um, well, before the last question from um, this part of the discussion, I invite you again to contribute your own questions to the chat. Uh, and for Evgeny, maybe for us to some, well, to finish this part of the conversation, uh, what comes to mind uh, if you're thinking about, you know, how can all the technologies that we have now and the data and everything be used for, well, to use this word, for emancipatory purposes or for non-capitalist purposes? Well, I mean, look, it's not a question of using the technologies right so i mean of course we can have and some people on the left love having that debate that we need to renationalize google we need to uh, somehow yeah. reappropriate facebook or we need to, uh, so i mean it's not as a matter of tactics i think this could be done if we figure out how to do it without triggering some bombs by the U.S. military in retaliation for it uh, you know speaking from the european kind of <laughs> uh, provinces, right? But um, I think more general, it's not a question of instrumentality that, you know, there is this thing called our AI or cloud computing and we just need to repurpose it. I think the debate should be a little bit more uh, sophisticated, right? And this is where we're almost back to the beginning of our discussion, which is where I was saying that, uh, you know, we need to have a conception of what do we find on the other end of high-tech neoliberalism, right? So with, we kind of know what the high-tech neoliberalism is. It's Uber, it's Airbnb, to some extent, it's Amazon, right? It's a combination of Taylorism uh, and some kind of, but legitimated differently, right? With super efficient use of resources with very little waste, at least uh, among some of the uh, inputs uh, and uh, we even understand uh, why it's appealing at least to some it could be that it's lower costs even though in very many cases it's just an illusion because venture capitalists are subsidizing the services so greatly that the lower costs are just a temporary fact of the business model but it could also be speed right it could be convenience who knows right so at the kind of neoliberal high-tech end of things, we know uh, what the future holds. It's not obvious to me what the non-neoliberal high-tech promise is, right? And this is where, again, we're back to the discussion we've been having earlier, which is what path should we take? Should it be the path of central planning? In which case we'll just say, well, we'll have the Soviet economy, but without shortages. So, you know, you're going to have uh, one brand of uh, lemonade, and uh, but it will always be available, so you wouldn't need to queue up, 
And that way we wouldn't have a lot of waste and that way also we wouldn't need advertising and perhaps we would not be uh, as damaging to the climate as before because there'll just be one brand and there will not be waste products. Or maybe uh, the non-neoliberal high-tech option should be something else and it should be discovering some other ideas, you know, whether they will be those of communes or cooperatives or some kind of other forms of social organization that do not default to social do not default to central planning uh, is a big question. That, and it's only by first identifying what those normative goals and objectives are and should be that we would be able to understand what role technology should play in them. Right? So that's why I've, I've written this long piece for New Left Review uh, last year on digital socialism, where I kind of leave that question open. So it's, I, I, I don't presume to know. Uh, which of this path would be best and even within those paths what the right configuration of kind of normative commitments should be but it's obvious to me and it was obvious then and it's obvious now that neither of those two possibilities would be possible without first establishing firm control over what and that asset i call feedback infrastructure uh, this mm -hmm. or you can call the stack you can call it however you want right that ultimately this ability to monitor uh compute um predict and distribute right if you want to assign kind of for verbs to it to me it's a key uh ingredient to that future whether the future will be about planning and more efficient distribution of goods or whether it will be about redistributing power for local units that can then engage in some kind of social coordination in their everyday life perhaps in their communal life and uh, make any acts of social collaboration into an opportunity for learning new things and inventing new things right so maybe it's all about expanding how we define what it means to be productive what it means to innovate and then building the right infrastructure through which we can harness this little subversive acts of producing new knowledge or producing new practices, which we do not do a very good job of, you know, everyday life, unless it's directly monetizable, right? So it's true that I might be extremely inventive when talking to my relatives or children or parents or whatever, and I might be solving a lot of problems in my everyday life. And once scaled up, uh, those problem solving skills, like, you know, contributions to Wikipedia can make a huge difference, right? We just need the right infrastructure to accumulate them and scale them up. And once we scale them up properly, it might make a huge difference. The problem is that none of that currently fits into the digital economy that we have now. So these activities are not really scalable and there is very little money going towards, you know, what in the more acceptable kind of parts uh, you would call social innovation right which is kind of also a term that now sticks but broadly speaking what i'm saying is that this question that you've asked me about how we can redeploy technology for a more emancipatory project it can only be answered uh, if we know what that project is right uh, but I, I, and, and then it's not just a matter of instrumentally redeploying things uh, it's a matter of understanding what kind of practices and what kind of you know property regimes and organizational structures we'd like to put in place that would allow us to do things differently and once we do that then you know maybe uh, ai along the commercial model will satisfy some of that but perhaps not in which case we would need to think of this as a public good which would require a lot of funding you know and one example that i like to give when I speak about the immense waste that is also present in the digital economy, is just thinking about how we currently spend billions and tens of billions of dollars on training AI models. So you have this, you know, 10 big tech firms in five in China and five in America, mm -hmm. essentially pouring tens of billions of dollars a year just to train uh essentially, and to build identical skills, whether it's in object recognition or in voice recognition or in sound recognition, right? They all, and they often train them with the same data sets. It's just extremely mm -hmm. uh, capital intensive and occasionally labor intensive. And we end up uh, paying, you know, or they end up paying uh, 100 billion uh, a year uh, to get something which you could 
arguably get for 10 or 15 billion a year, but do it in a centralized manner and have it available as a public good and infrastructure and not have it available only as a service that's proprietary and unique to those firms. Right? And this is where offering an alternative conception of what AI would mean if it were a public good or an infrastructure, right? and then understanding what would be the consequences of it. Because it's obvious to me also somebody who runs essentially a digital entity like the syllabus where you know, we do have to use the APIs of a lot of <laughs> these firms, right? So I send a pretty good check every month to Google because we use quite a lot of the APIs. And I can tell you that uh, if uh, we did not have to pay those fees, um, and if others did not have to pay those fees because uh, something like cloud computing would be available as a common good, there would be many more projects like ours because they wouldn't face the same monthly costs. Now, to me, it's obvious that what prevents a lot of the more creative opportunities from springing up is the fact that despite all this talk about free stuff in the digital economy, mm-hmm. so much of it is still essentially priced by use. And, and by usage. And as long as it's priced by usage, the uh, amount of innovation you can do with that is quite limited. And the people who can innovate are quite limited, right? So this is the reason why most of the innovation now happens through startups who manage to then go and raise money from venture capital firms. And they are the ones at the frontier of innovation. They're the ones on the cutting edge. But it also means that uh, the likely product that comes out of all this innovation will be an app that will either suck in your data and it will try to create some kind of artificial barrier when none existed before because you would need to make people pay for the product that you're offering them. You know, and the syllabus in that sense is no exception. We will be charging people subscription fees because that's the only way for us to recoup the costs, and which are not trivial, which also have to go, you know, we have to send checks down to Google and Amazon and all these other firms that uh, have erected barriers around their content. That, so to some extent, it's um, it's an economy that can be hugely profitable, but it's an economy that prioritizes just one particular way of social organization, and the social organization is the startup. So you know, so for me, it was actually quite weird as a, somebody who spent almost a decade criticizing comp- tech companies and startups to essentially end up with one. But that's just the reality of where we are. Um, well, thank you for, for this part. Uh, we will now join the other room because uh, this setting is a bit improvised because of the Corona times. Uh, so we have, apart from all of you who are listening to us and watching us on this live stream, we also have some live audience in the next room. And uh, Hi. They will also <laughs> and they will also be asking questions. So the first one comes from Sandra. Hi, both of you. Uh, Evgeny, I have just one question which is not related to your uh, lecture. Do you have birds in your backyard? Yes, yes, I know. I, I, sorry it if they caused any very trouble, ni- but... No, 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 it was very nice. <laughs> it was ah, a perfect, okay. perfect audio. They're not, they're not my birds. They just, they just like me, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, I have one comment and I like especially this last part of uh, your talk. My first comment is related to the term post-COVID-19 world. And it it reminds me uh, for a similar word, which was used, it's, it's still using now after the fall of communist and socialist societies. And this was word transition. So we were constantly in transition from somewhere to somewhere from to anti-liberal, illiberal, neoliberal policies, and so on. Uh, and now we are living in um, narratives which you are trying to explain. It's very important be- because constantly through media and through, pol- through pol- political language, we are reminded we have to accept, accept the new normal, which is not normal at all. And uh, we are like approaching to kind of society, it looks like Black Mirror version of society, where politicians treat people like biohazard, which can be traceable, trackable, data mineable for political profit and economical profit. So I don't think that this term post COVID-19 world has any analytical or 
let's say, political use for at least left politics. And now my, my question is related also to the last one when you are, when Leonard asked you about um, how to use this technology for emancipatory politics. And you said that there on left there are some ideas of how to nationalize these tech, tech companies. But we don't need to nationalize them. The, the most important question is that we are pumping enormous amount of money, of public money, in these companies, especially now. And I'm related this to an article published by Naomi Klein in The Intercept. I think it was her last, her, her last article when she was using this particular event when May, uh, governor of New York was invited uh, Schmidt and Bill Gates and other big companies to be actively involved in this post COVID-19 world. So my question is, uh, she said that we are resembling a coherent pandemic shock doctrine uh, in she call it is like screen new deal. I'm asking you, to make a little more, let's say, intellectual, intellectual uh, trying to uh, give some kind of part for people who are now repressed as a result of this uh, extreme uh, political pressures we are living now in all our societies. So on which particular topics we should be focused? Well, that's an ambitious question, but related to tech or in, you know, in general? Related. Let's start with tech. We don't need now to open the whole, mm -hmm. the whole discussion. Sure. I mean, well, you're, I mean, look, you're, it's, 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 no, no, but it's, it's, not, it's not a problem to um, build the intermediate stage between sort of let, let, let me give you kind of a, a, a broad answer first. So it's obvious that at least within my system of coordinates, the ultimate goal is trying to build and defend these infrastructures for new forms of social coordination that do not def default to the market or the price system, right? And that also hopefully do not default to central planning. So that's the kind of overarching project because I think that ultimately and as I've explained throughout the talk, that the uh, problem that the left faces is the inability to offer any kind of social vision of how a high-tech world could function in a way that would actually be more conducive to innovation, more conducive to some kind of knowledge sharing, and more conducive to new forms of sociality, if you will, than what neoliberalism offers us. That's a very abstract goal. Right, which can take us 300 years to fulfill and to accomplish. Um, in the near term and in the midterm, of course, there are certain conditions uh, that are necessary for us to meet so that that vision is still plausible and that is still tenable. Right. So clearly, uh, we cannot just go and claim reclaim this feedback infrastructure tomorrow because ultimately there is nothing to claim because it's all run in the cloud somewhere from a server in California. Right? So we cannot just go and uh, re-municipalize it the way we could have re-municipalized you know, the energy grid or the gas networks or the water pipes. Right? So it's, a, it's, it's plausible with some of the cable infrastructure, but it's not really plausible with services that run of them because they're virtual. Uh, <clears throat> so this is why what we need is a tactical agenda which will uh, tell us what we need to do on a couple of key in a couple of key dimensions what do we need to do in terms of trade uh, for example do we want to nurture in the short term our own european tech industry because we can't really hope that without a tech industry uh, the rest of our industries will survive. I mean, ultimately, what happens if tomorrow you're going to say, okay, so in Europe, you'd like to have European tax sovereignty, as you know, Macron and many others have been saying. So what we need is technological sovereignty. Well, what does it mean in practice? That essentially, we are going to cut ourselves off from the Chinese providers of cloud computing and AI services and from the American ones. And then what are we left with? 
and uh, we will be left with European industry that will essentially have no ability to stay competitive vis-a-vis -vis Chinese and American and any other competitors, right? Is that a question or problem for the left? I don't know. We have to decide that. Maybe it's not a problem and screw European industry. And if we become less competitive, so be it. I just don't think that it's an answer that will get us very far. So in that sense, we can have a very pragmatic agenda with you know quite a few talking points and quite a few political positions and not just on trade but also on what the right mergers and acquisitions policy should be uh, when it comes to um, i don't know competition policy uh, which also has been a subject of debate in europe what should be the right uh, policy on taxation of these firms, how far we would be able to balance that policy with the uh, inability of Europe to essentially counterbalance the United States. So of course we can tax uh, Google and we can tax Microsoft and we can tax Amazon all the way we want. But if that would mean that once the economy recovers, we will have to uh, surrender the idea of ever exporting European products to the United States, then it will not receive a lot of popular support, neither among a lot of European voters nor among European politicians. I guess all I'm saying is that I don't see the COVID crisis uh, in any radical way affecting this debate that we've been having for a couple of years now. So I wish I could tell you that all you have to go now is to go and work on some kind of data cooperative and uh, create some kind of artisanal data production networks, right? Which might be reassuring, but at this point, it will be like working and joining an arts and crafts uh, cooperative of some kind, hoping that you're gonna uh, reverse the project of Taylorism or Fordism. Right? Uh, to do that, you need a very different set of tools and techniques. So at this point, in a more pragmatic way, if that's what you're asking, uh, a lot of the debates and decisions we need to make, they'll still have to pass through Brussels, they'll still have to pass through very boring meeting rooms, and they will need to pass through political parties and trade unions as intermediaries. I just don't see any other way, which means that plenty of compromises will be added and plenty of commitments to far less exciting projects will need to be taken on board. But unfortunately, you know, this, this field uh, uh, is just too entangled with geopolitics mm -hmm. and with global economy for us to contemplate some kind of easy i mean i sound like a politician now but it's just it's very hard to contemplate easy fixes here when it's a matter of economic political and fiscal policy which in europe even without this digital dimension have never really been fully harmonized and maybe they shouldn't be right so uh, it's a mess and you know anybody I mean, it's of course possible to be steering up this i don't want to say populist because this term means absolutely nothing these days but it's but possible to be kind of steering up this anger against the big tech. And that's a very convenient target. And, you know, Naomi Klein and others that do it very well. It's just that it means to me absolutely little because it still doesn't tell you what the post big tech, if not post COVID world looks like. And how do we get there given where we are now in Europe? And, you know, because this question can only be asked from within some vantage point. And I think in Europe, we have a vantage point. Uh, and unfortunately, that vantage point is the overall crisis of the European project as such. So um, I wish I could give you a more reassuring answer about how you as a citizen <laughs> can get engaged, but it's kind of a big mess. No, we are already engaged, so <laughs> don't worry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, do we already have another question? Yes, we do. Hey, uh, hi, I'm Nate. Um, let me start with a slight provocation. Uh, isn't perhaps the problem with the left that there is not enough solutionism, so to speak? Uh, let me explain. Um, so 
there is a, a certain utopian element uh, that stirs the Im imagination that is present in what you describe as uh, technological solutionism. Even though in it its Silicon Valley variety, it's obviously limited by this, what Mark Fisher famously dubbed capitalist realism, right? So it's definitely stuck into the coordinates of thinking with it and what is essentially a neoliberal framework. Um, but on the other hand, um, if you look at uh, the, the contemporary left today, there's very few attempts at this sort of, um, let's say, okay, here we're talking about post-COVID, uh, but we could say post-neoliberal um, thinking about the future, about uh, there is very little imagination going on, except for cases such as, for example, uh, what some other um, fellow millennials have cooked up in uh, the UK, that is, um, so-called left accelerationist projects, uh, you know, uh, or fully automated luxury communism work by people like uh, Nick Cernik or Aram Bastani. Um, and even though I wouldn't really, you know, totally subscribe to their views, isn't like um, one of the things that is lacking, I guess, in a contemporary left political project, precisely this sort of utopian component uh which i think there is a certain demand for it take for example how popular works by people like bogdano are becoming in recent years or even uh, for example uh, like very weird uh, offshoots of history like posadism um it seems to me that there there is a certain component, utopian component of solutionism that uh, you know still has to be included in a certain measure in a contemporary left project. I guess basically what I just want you to comment upon shortly is uh, what do you think about these developments these couple of years? So the popular the renewed popularity of this sort of sci-fi utopian ideals on the left and how they manifested themselves inside, well, uh, it was a meager attempt in politics, but still, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I think I, I definitely am on board with the broader comment you've made about the need for some kind of utopian strand in leftist thought, which might have gone missing uh, in part because, um, again, because of the Cold War and the kind of post-Cold War climate, uh, very little thinking went into imagining alternative futures and ways of organizing. I wouldn't, however, uh, surrender uh, this ground and give up this ground to solutionism as it exists in Silicon Valley and that I don't think that there is much utopia there at all. If there is anything, it's some kind of false marketing which uh, advertises uh, solutions which are offered by markets and essentially commodities as technological solutions. So for me, uh, you know, solutionism uh, is essentially commodification of politics uh, whereby um, controversial uh, and somewhat um, contentious issues uh, become reduced to a market-led solution, which then is presented as completely unproblematic. In that sense, I think it's not, it's almost the opposite of utopia, and it's quite realistic uh, about saying that there is nothing but the market out there, and it will solve your problem. So it's 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 as utopian as the you know Thatcherian saying that there is no alternative is utopian. Right? To me, it's, it's more dystopian, uh, but somehow packaged in some kind of uh, language of um, technological sublime. And I think that here, while there is clearly a lot of sublimity, if you will, uh, going around, I wouldn't necessarily equate that to utopia. Um, that said, you know, the proliferation of uh, interest in science fiction uh, and kind of more future, futuristic, if you will, oriented uh, projects on the left, I mean, uh, to me, it's a sign of weakness and crisis, to be honest, more than it is a sign of robustness. So, you know, I, I don't think that uh, given where we are right now, 
it's the re close readings of Bogdanov that will tell you how you're going to deal with the interest that private equity firms or sovereign interest for sovereign wealth funds have and your particular local national champion. You know, maybe it should not be the problem of the left. It's also plausible, but uh, I just think that the problem with the left is that it's drowning in culture and it does very little by means of actual analysis of how the global economy operates. You know, and these people spend far too much time reading Bogdanov than reading the Wall Street Journal and Financial Times. And unless the left, uh, like Marx did, uh, finally uh, starts reading uh, <laughs> and learning more about global economy without drowning in theory and concepts and uh, artistic theories, uh, unless it starts doing what it should be doing, which is analyzing relations of production, global value chains, and, and all of that, it's just going to remain what it has been until now, which is something you can package in an art gallery and sell. And, uh, you know, if you think that that's what the goal of the leftist project should be, then yes, sure. You can spice it up with quite a lot of obscure theories from all over Eastern Europe, Latin America and whatnot, but it's just not my cup of tea. So in that sense, I, but I've been traditionally quite skeptical of such efforts to read capitalism culturally and, you know, without invoking any names of your fellow compatriots, it's just never really appealed to me very much. Thank you. And I think we have another question. Uh, yes, uh, hello. Uh, maybe if I may firstly to uh, introduce a little bit. I'm a sociologist and also uh, I'm a public servant uh, working with uh, beyond GDP indicators, the growth indicators, uh, interested in uh, postmodern sociology but uh, I also wrote the first and only um, universal basic income proposal for Slovenia. I did that 10 years ago. So I was really uh, interested in um, listening about basic income ideas, uh, how you understand them and so on. But uh, my major uh, comment and question is concerned with, uh, I believe, a really important topic. This is gender. So I'm interested in how much have your thoughts about gender perspective on this technology thing. And as I understood you and Leonard, it's like uh, talking about this bond between technology and neoliberalism and pre predators um, uh, way of doing things. I can see this as uh, a sign of undercentric uh, society. And in that sense, it's really interesting, like what will happen when we will understand that uh, women are the only workers left that can produce something machines can't. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, look, you, you're right in that we have not uh, paid much attention to this element in, in, in this chat. It does not mean that we, I certainly ignore it. I don't ignore it in my uh kind of intellectual praxis um and you know a lot of the uh thinking for example that has happened in the last few years when we try to grapple with the ways in which data can or cannot be constituted as a form of labor a lot of those insights essentially went back to the debates uh, that were happening in the early 1970s about household work right and the way in which um, women's struggles at the time could inform our thinking about what the right set of demands or even representations of data labor if one can use that word term i'm not convinced uh, could be and should be um that said i am i'm also fully on board with you uh in that the gender dimension and, and, and the costs if you will to, to women 
of uh, the current economy, heavily digitized economy, they uh, remain by and large invisible in the public debate. We try to address that somewhat with the syllabus. We do have quite a lot of articles we've uncovered in the last uh, two months uh, about the social toll, if you will, the invisible social toll on women of this epidemic and pandemic. And I'm, I'm fully on board with you there. Um, the but again, I, I wouldn't uh, artificially uh, kind of present myself as a, as a intimately familiar with uh, all the contemporary debates and gender uh, studies. Right? I, I'm, I'm not, not because I don't find them interesting or entertaining or intellectually stimulating, but um, mostly because my attention has been elsewhere. But as much as I could, I tried to keep up. We actually have a module out of 60 modules we have on the syllabus as a module related to gender. So every now and then, well, every week, essentially, we do include papers related to gender in it. But uh, yeah, um, ultimately, uh, I would argue that some of the most interesting and exciting work that's been done in the past decade or so also you know in marxist theory that's been around the question of social reproduction and social reproduction theory and of course that does have a strong gender dimension and a lot of that also draws on the work that i've already described from the early 1970s around the question of household uh, chores done by women so uh i follow that somewhat uh, but uh, again, I still haven't found a way to fully and completely integrate it into kind of the broader theory of digital capitalism. If I can use that word, but uh, more remains to be done. If I may, I would like just to give some kind of comment on that. Like you, you two were talking about left and right. Uh, politic uh, is not very different. Uh, and I do agree, as I said, I believe it's undercentric. But uh, in uh, saying that, I'm very optimistic about the future. I believe that utopian alternative world can be produced by different kinds of thinking. And uh, so I am uh, waiting for, for women to start to talk about different kinds of wor uh, world, uh, utopian maybe or not. Uh, also, I would just like to say, say that uh, pre-COVID, uh, in pre-COVID time, I could only see the future for women as a maid's tale. But in this post-COVID world, I'm more optimistic. Uh, also, I'm a bit scared for men, uh, but I believe that uh, women can be like in the first row of using technology and accepting, accepting technology. You know, you all are talking all the time about surveillance and scaring of being um like under control, but the women who are mostly victims of uh, um, bullies, we may be happy about surveillance, you know, and uh, feeling safer. And I believe this is kind of dangerous thing. We should really think about it, how genders are different except in accepting what is happening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure, thanks. Uh, now, I think that we have uh, time for a couple of more questions from your chats. Uh, Nika has selected them according to, uh, I think, what we have not yet covered. So, Nika, welcome. Hello. Um, so, it was quite difficult to choose the questions because some of the questions were already answered in the process. Um, but I'm gonna try. So the first question is from Maya Bogatajancic, and it goes like this. There is a new EU copyright reform happening right now. There is finally a new exception for text and data mining for researchers and businesses as well. But copyright owners will be able to prohibit text data mining for non-researchers, even on open web. Or some member states will impose remuneration for the text data mining for businesses. Will the EU be able to compete with the rest of the world? Some claim that EU, EU AI will be less inclusive. 
do you have an opinion about this? Well, I do have an opinion about this as somebody who does a lot of text mining <laughs> for my own project. Yes, I'm not particularly happy about what uh, the EU is going to do uh, in that, you know, I think uh, ultimately, uh, I mean, it's a tricky question, but uh, everything else being equal, uh, imposing extra barriers uh, that stand in the way of uh, entities doing text mining, it's not... Uh, it's not a good practice uh, in general. Uh, abstracting when from the dynamics of global competition. Um, so it's true that I would ideally make it harder for the likes of Google and Amazon to text mine than for a small startup. So you can have some kind of differentiated scheme of access because ultimately having Google pay the same fee as a small organization would mean that it will be very expensive for the organization, but cost almost nothing to Google. Uh, so there are, of course, uh, debates that we could have and should have about also whether making it completely free would make it likely that it will be the big players that are going to dominate the field. But by and large, as a matter of principle, I think we should be making uh, it as easy as possible, provided we can account for all these power imbalances in terms of how much you can do if you're a small entity as opposed to Google and Microsoft. All, all of that being equal, I think we should be making it as easy as possible for uh, anybody who wants to text mine something in order to generate uh, some kind of second order analysis to do that. So, but again, I speak from a very biased position in that you know I have built a service that text mines quite a lot of resources online, and uh, you know it doesn't it doesn't sound particularly promising this future in which we are heading. Uh, because I think it, it will, again, I don't want to draw the comparison to GDPR, but the risk here is that to some extent, only those with outsized budgets would be able to pay for tax mining. And in this case, it will just solidify it and consolidate the dominance of players that are already big. Uh, Nika, next questions? Yeah, so the next one is from Francisca. And the question is, what is the role of uh, EU venture capital policy in the neoliberalism solutionism slash state market nexus? Well, I don't think it's specific to EU. I mean, ultimately, uh, that's to some extent how we have accepted. Well, we have accepted the American model, which, you know, which is where venture capital sort of comes from, whereby uh, <laughs> we are going to take a lot of risks and a lot of bets and we are going to put a lot of money into a thousand different projects and maybe one of those projects will work and it will make the people who invested this money billionaires and trillionaires and uh, the other 999 that don't make it are going to suffer and become a complete failure but we are going to sugarcoat it and somehow pretend that that's not a problem right because one project has made it and it has made us millionaires and billionaires so from that perspective i think it's hugely inefficient from societal viewpoint it might be extremely profitable and it has been which is why a lot of money flows into it but from the perspective of organizing uh, productive activity it's just a giant waste of resources uh, right but beyond that i think the problem with venture capital is that, like all capital, it always wants to expand. And uh, uh, it means in practice that areas that were previously off limits to startups uh, suddenly become areas where startups can offer some solution and venture capital can you know, pour in and make sure that there are now 300 of them. So there is this constant pressure to turn every area of life an economic activity into a profit-making operation where startups can play a role. And that's kind of the second order consequence of this venturization, if you will, of the economy that most of us haven't yet fully grappled with. Nika, do we have another one? Yeah. So uh, this one is from Frankfurt, who joined Consensus Distributed event last week. And Apparently, it was full of solutionist talks, and it was as great as well, they're saying. Um, but in the perspective of today's talk, and also in a way referring to our next Money Lab event, um, they would like to ask, what is your opinion on all the blockchain hopes? 
as it appears to be just another frontier to be colonized by neoliberalism, as you call it. Well, I mean, look, I think we have to understand that there is the blockchain, the technology, and on blockchain, the, the ecosystem, right? And the ecosystem is something that uh, is uh, kind of a product of particular historical developments and combination of forces. So right now, yes, you'd probably define it as a combination of various neoliberal forces trying to make sense of how the blockchain can be used to their project. But as such, I don't really see a technology such as the blockchain as some kind of inherently neoliberal tool and instrument. And in that sense, I think, yes, yeah, sure, we can explore the ways in which it can be repurposed and uh, for the needs of a different ecosystem. It's just that it's not obvious to me that that should be at the top of anyone's agenda. Right? And the reason why I think there is so much excitement about the blockchain and crypto on the left is that you have a lot of young, talented tech people who became disappointed with capitalism or became disappointed with the kind of neoliberal bubble around the blockchain and now they would like to repurpose it for something else but the question is you know if you were trying to build the future of the left project where would you put the kind of the blockchain strategy on, on, on that agenda and i bet that you wouldn't put it in the top 10. Um, so the hype is not so much about the blockchain as a technology the hype is there mostly because how should I put it? It's not obvious to me that it's something that's going to resolve fundamental problems of the left. Right? So uh, it can definitely be useful and it can definitely be repurposed to serve a different purpose. It's just that it should not really, in my opinion, talk anyone's agenda. So, uh, you know, of course, if you have talented young people who see no other way to contribute to an alternative political project, let them work on it. But you know, they might as well learn some extra skills and then just do something that will help that project even more. Well, uh, thank you to uh, for, for all your attention and your questions. Thanks to the audience and to our online audience. And of course, thank you, Evgeny, for, for your time and um, comments and thought and explanations. Uh, well, this was uh, today's episode. How is gold of Money Lab number eight? And uh, bye for from us. And we're leaving some, I think, final thoughts and remarks to to Yanis. Thank you, Leonard, for leading the session. Thanks, Eugenie, for sharing your thought with us. And thanks to our special guest in studio and the audience online for contributing with your comments and questions. And also to Nika for moderating the online chat. This event, produced in the framework of Con's platform for contemporary investigative art, wouldn't have been possible without the joint effort of the staff of Axioma Institute and Kino Shishka. We will be with you again next Monday, May 25th, always at 5 p.m. Central European time and always at this URL, axioma.org slash moneylab8. For the third streaming event, we have the digital social innovation expert, Denis Royo, better known by his hacker nickname, Jaromil, with a talk entitled Data Sovereignty and Proximity Tracing that will be introduced and moderated by the director of the NGO Citizen D, Domen Savage. Thanks for being with us today. See you next week. Thank you.